content warning for discussions of death, death of a parent, injury to a child, racism, and romance. <laughs> if any that is... What a wonderful cocktail. It's important that we all know how to be safe around a table pretending to be elves. So, uh, I've, I've kindly been supplied with a guide. This is not drama, but it could be cringe. Safety tools used in critical role. Oh, no. The oh, fuck. Five minutes on why safety tools are important while playing make-believe. What are safety tools? And we have... No, that's spoilers. I don't think a consent form is in there, though. And the reason I don't think it is, is on the basis that I don't think Critical Role have ever said they use them. Aftercare? Isn't that like... Don't certain smutty videos say, including aftercare? <laughs> okay, let's go! I think it's pretty clear this video is gonna be good. Okay. If you enjoy <clears throat> Critical Role, then you, like me, love watching these nerdy-ass voice actors roleplay their hearts out. Play Dungeons but and Dragons! But during emotional, intense, or intimate scenes, you may have wondered, or even worried, about how the cast look after each other around the table. Stop. Please. Because of the way these people are, perhaps you'd wonder how do they look after each other around the table. Because you know they're all Care Bear types, right? I- There's no fucking way anyone watches Critical Role and goes, Man, I'm really worried about how these people look after themselves playing this game. Worried? You might wonder what they do or if they do anything. Worry? I'm worried about the safety of these people. That, that, was a, that was a TPK. I think they're gonna end it all. Full disclosure. I mean, I didn't like season three. I stopped watching it because it just bored me. I like Critical Role. Particularly season two. Full disclosure. I've been running games as a GM for a little while now, and I'd love to outline some of the ways I see the cast caring for each other on and off the table, and maybe introduce you to some safety tools you can use at your next game. <laughs> Does Matt Mercer cu cuddle them after he pulls out of their leaking D and Dussy? Or is it is it D and D or C or is it D and Dussy? Maybe introduce you to some safety tools you can use at your next game. In this video, I'm going to outline a little about why safety tools are important and needed at every table. This is like you just started working at a supermarket and you're watching the, the little video that's like, wear steel-toed shoes, because if you don't and you cut your fucking foot off, it's not our problem. Discuss what tabletop role-playing game tools actually are, and show you how I see Critical Role use safety tools before, during, and after their games. This video won't be an in-depth instruction of how to implement these tools. What is this Dragon Ball Z OC? Vroom. I cast SHIELD! That video will be four hours long. And who would watch a four hour long YouTube video? So I have links to a bunch of resources in the description below to help you find out how to implement these tools in your games. Stop! Before you are any further, you must know <laughs> this way lies big spoilers. Like seriously. Wait! Safety is super important, guys. By the way, I'm gonna gate- I'm gonna gate your safety. Your safety! Behind a spoiler warning. I spoil major plot points and endgame details, PC deaths, in-game relationships. This video will spoil some of the biggest moments of Critical Role Campaign 1 and 2, and a small spoiler for LA by Nights. Also, content warning for discussions of death, death of a parent, injury to a child, racism, and romance. <laughs> if any that is... What a wonderful cocktail. What a wonderful cocktail. By the way... Spoiler warning. Stop now. Content warning, death of a parent. You just, you just did the spoiler. True. Content warning, romance. True. True. Immediately after the spoiler warning. Content warning. Main character death at end during final fight. Content warning. Uh, he was Kaiser Soze, Kaiser Soze all along. Content warning. If these warnings mean you can't watch, then that is okay. I... I couldn't imagine... Unless I was being bitchy. Telling someone it's... Like, giving someone permission to not watch my video. You can't watch, that's okay. Description below for resources on the topic of tabletop role-playing game safety tools and have a great day So 
Why do we need safety tools? It is because even if you are playing a character, it is always you. No matter how Even if you're playing a character, it is always you. Literally true in that you're always there, but I have a <laughs> I have a feeling she means something else. I have a strong feeling she means the character is like an avatar of you. Even when you're making a puppet do things, it's always you. Yeah, but if you stab the puppet, that's not the same as me getting stabbed. It's me control- it's always you controlling it, you're always there, but mmm... Where are you gonna go with this? How deep your roleplay. Here's Brennan with a great metaphor. In improv, we talk about this all the time, which is that when you're playing a character, even something like, oh, really different from yourself, <laughs> right? It's still always you. My favorite metaphor- Yeah, you don't literally become another person, but I have a- they're gonna go way too far with this. I can always smell- I can- always- I can almost smell it. I can always, I can always smell Brennan Lee Mulligan. Oh. For, for character playing has always been that characters are translucent and not opaque, where they're like stained glass, right? Uh, and in this metaphor, it's sort of like you, the person, are the light behind the stained glass. And what the character is, is it's always still you, but the colors and shapes and the way things are arranged change and the light shines through differently. Yeah. No. That's a very particular way of doing a character. A character can straight up be a marionette. Siffy, you say, WTF does that even mean? I think he means it's a reflection of you. That the, it seems like he's saying there's a, there's a connection between you. You, there's a line from you through to your character, and so there's a line from your character through to you. That's, that's what I think he's saying. Are you saying are you saying no to my characterization of what he's saying or no to that being true? Because I agree that's not true, but I think I think the idea is there's always going to be there's always going to be part of you in the character. Literally true, literally true. How far they're going to take it? No, no. Oh, they they stabbed the puppet you were controlling. Your fingers are on those strings. Are you okay? Yeah. It's a great metaphor. Yeah. Uh <laughs> This means that what happens to your character at the table also affects you. How much though? Yeah, my, my, the character I like is dead and out of the campaign. Oh man, that's a bummer. That far, that's like, that's like about as far as I think it goes. That's about as far as I think it goes. Unless. Now let me take a little guess. If you are someone who does self-insert characters and cannot conceive of doing it in any other way, maybe, then maybe this is true for you. You can even experience what is known as character bleed, where you struggle to detangle your feelings from that of your character. There were a few- Ah! <laughs> this is illness. This is a disease. Anyone who says I experienced this, it's a disease. Literally diseased. Literally need- Medical care, mental health care. New games that I would leave from, and I would kind of have a little bit of this like anger and frustration, and it was like pissing me off, yeah. like it, like it, inhabiting her. Inhabiting her, maybe like in the same way. <clears throat> In the same way that you can be emotionally moved by a movie or a book, you could be moved by the events because you're, it's a, it's like a generative story. It's a story you're collectively generating. <clears throat> you can have a, an emotional reaction to that around a table with people. Sure. That doesn't mean like you're morphing into your character and you feel it because you're connected to them and stuff. No, it's you, it's you experiencing a drama. That's not. The way they're presenting this makes me think they don't mean that. They, I mean, it's what they're saying. They literally mean it's a tether to your character and your, your character's feelings bleed into you. I don't think that's it. The ability to affect our inner self means inner that self. D, D can act almost like, and actually be, therapy. Jesus Christ. Sorry, lady, but I don't think therapy is supposed to give you schizophrenia. D&D &D for me is a great cathartic release for me and acts kind of like therapy. Is it the same for you? And if so this guy, this is the guy Critical Role deleted hundreds of their videos on their channel for because he was in them and they wanted to wipe all trace of him because apparently he was physically and verbally abusive to one of the cast members in a relationship and divorced her. So they wiped him from their channel because he's a monster, allegedly.
just so you know, just so you know, that's this guy. <laughs> this is the, the, the guy who is their example of D&D acting as therapy is the guy who they're actively trying to wipe out now because apparently he's physically and verbally abusive and off his rocker. So, yeah, maybe it did function as therapy for him. Look what it does. Just saying. So, does it help your mental health? It's called a bonus illness. <laughs> ah, you forgot. I still have a bonus illness to use. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I look forward to this game before it was a show and when it was a show uh, every week. It just let me kind of get my demons out. There is a that example? That example just sounds like catharsis. That is not the same as, like, literally being therapy. Right. Right. In the same way that you could be like, oh, on the weekend I just go out and I fucking surf and I just keep going until I can't go anymore and it just gets my demons out. Would you be like, surfing is therapy and you need aftercare. Maybe you need aftercare if you get hurt, but you know what I'm saying. A lot of healing in this community. Jesus, there's fuck. a lot of healing in this game that we. Yeah, there's word of healing. There's cure wounds. I mean, technically, aid is healing, but it also it also increases your max hit points. There's tons of healing. Prayer of healing that heals a whole bunch of people in your line of sight at the same time. <laughs> She's not wrong. There is a lot of healing in D and D. In this storytelling, in this shared experience and we want other people to experience it. Although TTRPGs are used now in therapeutic situations, your D&D game with your friends should not take the place of a professional if you are needing help. To be entirely fair, true. Everything she just said is probably literally true. It is probably used in some therapy sessions. Playing D&D shouldn't replace actual help if you need. She did not say anything wrong. For one snippet, she, she just said things that are literally true and correct. Let's give her some of that. Give her some credit, okay? Well, it's a, it's a sort of a different type of catharsis, though, catharsis, really, right? Yeah. Because no matter what you're bringing to the table, even if it's the most real life of real life shit that you're going through, mm -hmm. it's still masked to a certain degree by a level of... There's like a, a safety of, there of course. to be able to okay. dive into those places. Yeah, because no one wants to sit at a table with someone who's like really working out their shit because it's like, it's, okay, maybe it's dangerous. time and a place. It dangerous. does not yeah. super safe. Time right. and a place, right? Yeah. And it's shit, yes. I feel like we've bounced from <clears throat> you need aftercare, you need safety because it's, it's therapy, blah, 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 blah. This guy's take... Is like, yeah, it can be great catharsis, it can make you feel better if you're working through shit to do some, I don't know, just go loot a fucking dungeon and it's like, man, I needed that, I needed to get away from my life and then just blow through some stuff. Sure. And then if someone has something really heavy, fuck off. Well, not fuck off, but like, it's like, bro. Bro, stop making up NPCs that look up, that look like the wife you're divorcing right now and making us kill her, please. It's weird. This is fine, but this isn't, this isn't what the video is ostensibly operating on. If it needs all these examples of how to stay fucking safe. Yeah. So, if we've worked out that emotions can be high and feelings can be raw at the table, why not just not be an arsehole? Just be nice to each other. Don't be an arsehole. Hey, that's it. The number one safety tool. Number one safety tool. Don't be an arsehole to other people. That's it. Literally it. Literally it. Don't hurt your fellow players. Stay kind. Hurt your fellow players, though. That's a given. What are we, what are we considering hurt here? Chill. When I say don't be an arsehole, it's like don't get into genuinely heated fights and fucking name call each other in real life. Don't hurt fellow players. Well, it's because you don't know what somebody else's line is. Oh no. You don't know what they have dealt with. Oh no. Racism, sexism, homophobia, ableism, phobias, and also PTSD triggers are all things that may not affect you, but could affect a player to the level that they don't return to your table. Me bringing fireworks to the Vietnam veteran roleplay evening. Some, especially younger DMs or people that are a little bit, um, 
not as well versed in like what can be uncomfortable for your players to go through, especially right. if you're DMing. Yeah. Because you're like, hey, we're all murdering each other. We're all chopping yeah. up orcs and stuff. Sure. Sure. Isn't that... Might as well throw in a child death or something. Yeah. yeah. Ex- Some people might not be comfortable with yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. So it's important to remember that like certain things are going to, uh, you know, affect people in different ways. This is the thing that gets me. Violence with weapons is something that really affects people. Is this the line? We're saying, oh, don't exclude people who are like triggered by child deaths. Don't exclude people who are, trigger- who are triggered by certain kinds uh, of situations, etc., etc., etc. Wait, but if if someone if someone is like a victim of knife crime and they're like, I want to play D and D with you guys, I can't handle any kind of violence with weapons. It seems like this is implying, oh, you can kick them out. You can just say, no, you can't play. For me personally, D and D is the only way that I really get to escape the BS that's happening in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. And like D and D is that thing where I just want to problem solve and enjoy my time. But when those you should check out Zachtronics, you'll love it. Those issues sneak in. It's hard to sit there and just be like, uh, like, uh, all right, well. Dang! All right, now I got to deal with this too in game because someone thought that that comment was cool. And- I don't know. Am I crazy? Isn't always having the mental overhead of the list of what you can't bring up the same as constantly having it in your mind? Could you beat this? Could you beat this by saying? Could you say, "Sorry, I have OCD, and if you try and push me into these rules, it's gonna trigger an obsession, so I can't." I can't go by these rules. You have to not let me, you have to let me not go by these rules because it's going to push me into uh, like an obsession spiral. And you might not share those same triggers, but also you didn't run this game for people to have a bad time, right? So like, why not accommodate the people and make sure that everyone's enjoying what you're doing? Here is Extra Credits expertly explaining why safety tools are necessary for TTRPGs. It's fucking nests. It's nesting. The video is nesting cringe. How? Who linked this? Who did this? It was you! Exathian! See you in 10 minutes, brother. <laughs> roller coasters. Most people think of roller coasters as fun, but if you described the experience to, I don't know, say your friendly neighborhood space alien, riding a roller coaster is about hurtling down a very high railroad track at top speed in an open train as you're thrown in a variety of directions. Which, if you think about it, doesn't sound like fun so much as sheer terror. And during the ride, there's a part of you that intellectually understands you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. But there's another part of you that's a little worried you might die. Playing a game that pushes your personal boundaries can feel the same. Well, maybe not the part about possibly dying, but it can be scary to dredge up the darker parts of your psyche and bring them out for everyone to see. Are we going to move on to how, uh... Because a roller coaster might not be fun, that experience might be very upsetting for someone. When they're going to get on the roller coaster, everyone on the roller coaster has to experience the roller coaster at two miles per hour. Just slowly creeping over the edge. Sorry guys, someone on here was in a car crash and they think moving fast on a roller coaster is going to really upset them, so... This roller coaster ride goes at two miles per hour. And sometimes it can be cathartic to play through that kind of scenario. Or even just be... Hexathion donated one pound. Tim, I need to be able to vent my reactions and chatter, I'll explode. <laughs> Good. A little evil in a game. Because that purging of fear, terror, or self-loathing that comes from being in a simulated environment that feels dangerous or stressful is really quite safe. And that's the key factor. Safety. Roller coaster. Yeah, you're a dumb fuck if you think you're in danger. At the table. What do you mean? The key factor is safety. If you're saying the key factor is safety, as opposed to the belief that you're safe, then you lose. Coasters have thick belts and heavy metal bars that remind us at all times that we're securely strapped in for the ride. Tabletop RPGs need to have the emotional equivalent of safety belts during gameplay so that players can get the most out of their catharsis without the experience inadvertently plunging over the edge and harming others. Without safety tools, you're on your friend. Hurtling down a track is actually dangerous without those features. They're not there. The fucking... The, the, the restraints that keep you in aren't there to make you feel safe. They might make you feel safe. They're there to make you actually not in danger in a situation that without them you would be in danger. Holy fuck. 
Obviously, he didn't literally mean a seatbelt, but I think the analogy breaks when you consider you're not in danger around the table. Unless, to be fair, if you're playing Dungeons and Dragons and there is a man who shows up to play with you and he's swinging a knife, yeah, probably a safety rule, don't swing the knife. Friends, no matter how close you are, are ticking down to a moment where someone gets hurt. With safety tools, you can go deep into roleplay, horror, and romance, and not only have the best of intentions, but actually know you are focused on each other's safety and have tools for dealing with problems when they come up. I'm 31 years old. You can just we can just talk. We are we are adults playing make believe. We don't need special tools. If you can't. If you can't just talk, you need like a group therapy or, or like to go live in a group home or something. So let's talk about what TTRPG safety tools actually are. Tabletop role-playing game safety tools are basically a set of communication strategies used at a table to keep players safe and comfortable. They are set up before a game, getting everyone on the same page regarding rules and tone and any content that is to be kept out of the game. Like, if you want to start getting into something like a more serious role-playing experience, I recommend talking to your dungeon master and your fellow PCs on it. Some people might just want a dungeon crawl type of game that's a little bit more hack and slash, collect loot and level up, and that's great. If you really want to get into that type of enriched RP enriched? experience... Enriched RP experience? Enriched with what? Uranium? I don't think there's anything wrong with talking with your players and being like, are we down to do this? Yeah. And just being on the same page. They are used during a game, so if the story does move into topics or emotions the player is not comfortable with, they always have control of stopping or changing the story. And they are used after a game to help players drop their characters and process what? any emotional elements that have come up during the game. Here is do people go into a, like a fugue state? They be they actually become their character. That's got to be a disease. There's got to be illness if that happens. You've got to help them extricate themselves from the the character they've been portraying or even just projecting. It's Kiana Shaw, who is a co-curator of the TTRPG Safety Toolkit, talking about safety as an extension of the social contract of playing any game. You can't play a game unless you're all on the same page as to what's acceptable or not. Uh, that goes like on all, on all levels of a tabletop RPG uh, social contract in a sense, right? So you have a social contract of like, you're the GM and I'm the player and this is what we do with that. Or, you know, it even goes down to the oh, it's my turn to bring the snacks. There's a social contract there, and safety is just another part of that. It's a you know, there are some people who never get out of the high school mindset. You, you've seen them, right? They might have a clique. You know, they might be a mean girl forever, even when they're, like, fucking 50. These are people who never got out of preschool. Who's bringing the ants on a log this time? Oh. What time are we going to have naps today? social contract of you know i want us to have fun and to enjoy what's going on and so me caring for your boundaries uh is a part of that here are some of the tools this isn't all of them and different kinds of tools are important for different games but this is a list of the ones that apply to most games fundamentally you need a way to communicate and be on the same page during here's a safety tool stay in the epic after debriefing, after Karen stars and wishes. Holy Christ, <laughs> dude, Hex, why did you toast this on the Discord? Before the game, have ways to deal with problems during the game, and have structures for debrief after the game. Over time, you find the tools that work for you, and you collect specific tools for genres like horror or romance. So the wildest thing about the aftercare is... It suggests to me that they're not just saying. Hexathion donated one Shut pound. the fuck up. And a little teapot short and stout. You don't just have to act a certain way during. Does this mean you're obligated to stay after and do like a therapy cool down? No. It's like no to the first part, but also extremely fucking no. You don't need a fucking toolkit. If someone's like, whoa, dude. 
that's that's not the tone. You know, it doesn't even have to be a safety thing. Like, it's just, ah, uh, bro, that's not the tone of this campaign. Whatever. I'm not going to stay behind and fucking console someone because their halfling, their halfling had a stillbirth. Not happening. Not happening, ever. Now let's look at how Critical Role uses some of these tools. Before the game. All these tools start with a central agreement. Trust. We are going to share an experience. Improv, role- Kind of wild that she doesn't have a trigger warning for these demented freaks that are going to haunt my nightmares for months. These little art designs, these little characters. Play, be silly, be serious, and agree that within this space, we will keep each other safe. Trust is first. Because as a dungeon master, you could just plop a red dragon down onto a group of first level characters. There's nothing in the rules saying you can't yeah, sure. do that. Fundamentally, D&D is a trust exercise. Mm -hmm. Role so. playing by itself takes a certain amount of bravery. Yeah, and, and then every la layer of it takes. Uh, I feel like that's trust in their ability to do something fun, interesting, and cool. I think you're putting faith that the person will be able to run the game in an enjoyable way, in terms of the game, not your mental health and safety. I wouldn't feel like. Put it this way, if we started a campaign and then the DM just went, oh, surprise, there are illithids everywhere, mm, you failed the perception check and you walked right into their uh, little cabal, they kill all of you. I wouldn't feel like my trust had been betrayed. It's not my trust being betrayed. It's not that kind of, it's not a bond of trust. It's having faith that they won't just be shit and not run the game incompetently. It's more bravery and trust and yeah. more experience and whatever, you know, to get you. And it's, it's about who you're sitting at the table with. Yeah, you know? absolutely. The holding is a trust fall. A little bit of an example of this that I love is when everyone in Critical Role joins in when Scanlan starts to sing a song. Sam is not going to be out there alone. As soon as the cast figure out what the song is, they're going to join in. Uh, well then I saw her mace do, 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 do. Now I'm a believer do, 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 without a They're all entertainers and voice actors and they're doing a stream so they're doing the more fun thing Hexathion donated one pound Time me out again A trace do, 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 Of blood in her hair <laughs> I don't think Well actually no You're saying he's not putting himself out there He is Constantly, because it's a stream. He's not putting himself out there any more than he already was. I don't... Wait, they are all theater kids. Or oh, most of them are literally theater kids, like, from the past. They have, a, they have that history to them, right? I don't think this illustrates anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in love. Ooh, oh, I'm a believer. <laughs> Take your D10. In regards to a session zero, we don't really. Do you think the woman speaking in this video would say, would join in with me singing my classic piece, "Gonna Rail That Retard Pussy"? Do you think she'd she'd have my back? We know what safety tools Critical Role applied before Campaign One or Two. In the Critical Role history book, we learn that Matt schedules a two to three hour lunch with guests before any appearance to talk about character creation. Yes. Holy fuck. If she says that this is for to make sure they're going to feel safe and accepted, it's a, it's a broadcast show. If she doesn't mention that, yes, of course, someone who's broadcasting a show in which there's role playing is going to spend a lot of time with someone before they're brought onto the show to make sure it's all going to work. This is their career. The show is their is their main product to get eyes on on their stuff and to get people to, you know, donate, sub, buy their merch, whatever. If she says this is about mental safety, please, dear God. In this quote, he doesn't specifically talk about safety tools. Oh shit! However, based on what Erica Ishii, who has been a guest on Critical Role, says here, I would assume there's 
some discussion about boundaries and expectations. In every game that I've played, in every good game that I've played, um, there's the talk beforehand of what's off limits, um, what, you know, like whether where, whether it's topics of discussion or in some cases like physical, uh, just like what are you comfortable with? All games and a it's a it's a professional show. This is a professional show. If she's talking about discussing with Matt Mercer, but she's not even necessarily. I need more context on that clip. She's saying because she's guested on Critical Role, she thinks she's referring, in, at least in part, to her experience with Critical. However, for Critical Role, it's a goddamn show. It's a business. There's a company running it. That is a different context. Even if they are like, is there anything that's going to upset you, blah, 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 blah. That could be corporate ass covering in this context. This isn't a good example. Especially streamed games should now start with an anonymous consent form to allow all players to in detail lay out what they are and are not comfortable with. For the cast as a whole, we can see that they understand with an anonymous huh? uh just like what are you comfortable let me watch that again with all games and especially streamed games should now start with an anonymous consent form she just she's just wha she's just whacking that out there all games should it's a moral imperative well she didn't say must but it's it's they should it's wrong to not do this she's saying it is wrong to not do this to allow all players to in detail lay out what they are and are not comfortable with. For the cast as a whole, we can see that they understand each other's boundaries, but how explicit that conversation was to start with, we don't know. Did they start with an anonymous consent form? Because according to you, if, it, they, if they didn't, then actually they're a bad example because they did something wrong. Here are some other tabletop role players talking about consenting gaming and how important a session zero is. Uh, session zero is super important. Not necessarily for these reasons, though. Consent, please. Oh, may I pet you? Yes, you may. Okay. Thank you. This is a gag. I believe they used, uh, what is it? Speak with plants? You know, the, the, the ability to talk to trees and shit. They were talking to a tuft of crabgrass, and the tuft of crabgrass, when they wanted to pet it, was like, um, could you ask for consent, please? This is just a gag. Part of like us playing together for the first time is us sending. She sent us Henry Crabgrass, I believe is the name. Crabgrass. It's a questionnaire saying, "Hey, what are we comfortable with?" And it went outside like race and gender, and it was a whole gore, violence, everything on this board, so she could build the perfect story so everyone could interact. And that way, when you know your limits, you can sort of push. You know, you can push and go to the extremes and know what's safe for you and for other people. Literally nothing you can say at a table, just with words, unless you're some sort of wizard and you know the incantations, nothing you can say will make me unsafe. I might not dig it, I might not like it, you might annoy me, maybe you'll make me angry if you're like directly saying shit to me. It'll never make me unsafe. And yeah. having those boundaries and then being able to work within them and like trusting your people leads to so many amazing moments. Oh, baby. Oh, my pal. <laughs> <laughs> Bro. <laughs> Dog, this is a show. This is this is shown to an audience. Do you understand? Do you understand that this is this is very different? Also, what a weird Hey, if you do all this, she might let you kiss her. If you follow all these rules, you might get a kiss. From communication when you start, before you start playing, too. Sometimes, if people aren't clear about what kind of game it's going to be when you get into it, 
you start dis discovering until it's too late that everyone had different ideas and expectations of it. Let's talk about during the game. One safety tool that usually gets set up before a game and used during a game is lines and veils. Lines being things you don't want in a game and veils being things right. you're okay to have in the game but behind a curtain and not described. You won't really see the cast cross a line during the game. Maybe harm to animals is almost a line because we have Matt saying this. It's a game you play for fun and it's not necessarily fun if part of being caught up in the story and the adventure is having to worry about every single moment they do something cool, they're going to kill their pet. And earlier... Sure. That's... I don't... I don't think that falls under emotional safety, though, even. Retro, you say what? So, throughout Campaign 2, I think there were various pets where they'd have, like, a pet in a bag or on their cloak or something. I think there was a weasel or some sort of fantasy weasel. And this is this is about like, oh, you do something crazy. And it's like, oh, sorry. You took half damage from that fireball, but your pet exploded. I think he's talking about how you just flub over the pet. You just ignore that the pet's in their backpack or whatever. And just go, whatever. He said it's like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be super fun to have to worry about your pet. Like it's cool to have the pet. It wouldn't be super fun to have to worry about the pet whenever you're fighting. Just the pet's fine, whatever, dude. I don't think this was like a mental health thing. It's it's like a, um, a stylistic thing and toned thing. On in the game, you can see for Travis that role playing romantic relationships was a line for him, and the cast respected that. I, I was not about romance in D and D. Where in the characters uh -huh. that I am playing, okay. I don't like it. It's too complicated. I'm not looking for it. For Travis. Right. I have a critical role knowledge. I have a critical role knowledge. Chat, are you aware of the relationship between these people? The man, second, second from left in the top, who is facing towards the woman next to him in, these, in this image. Him and Laura Bailey are married, and he opened up to romance because his wife wanted to encourage him to do romance, if I remember correctly. I don't think this is a typical example. I don't think this is a typical example. Travis, that line turned into a veil during the game as he felt more comfortable role-playing romance in D&D with his wife. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. You did it! The guy who never said he'd role-play romance initiated. I'm proud of you. She's missing something. The woman making this video, Soda Wax, is missing something important. Hey buddy, it's like fucking Laura Bailey. So yes. Proud of Travis, and I think we all were because gonna, we know. Are they going to mention it? Oh, that that was kind of a. a oh yeah, stepping out of his comfort zone. Yeah. Conversation. Yes, this is an example of someone being uncomfortable with something and then being pushed into doing it. In your video about lines and veils. She did say it was his wife. Yes, Fragmatic. She's missing that his wife, in an interview, I believe, specifically said she decided she's going to make him do it. Which is fine. I'm not saying that's bad. That's fine. Your wife is like, I want you to RP romance with me. I'm going to make you do it. That's fine. However, if we're talking about respecting people's boundaries and safety and whatever, the example where it's someone literally pressuring someone to get rid of the liner veil. Uh, should we emulate that? Should we follow your rules and then push someone into doing what they say they're uncomfortable with? Because that's a bad example if you don't mean that. ...about lines and veils are ongoing. You never know what could come up in a game that you need to stop and put boundaries around. Once Liam worked out that something might happen between Vax and Keyleth, he spoke to Matt about if that would be appropriate at the table. I don't remember what it was. I promise I don't remember what it oh, was, no. but something happened in one game. I just Bro, this is cuck shit. Do you want to, I let me let me rewatch this. About if that would be appropriate. You never know what could come up in a game that you need to stop and put boundaries around. 
Once Liam worked out that something might happen between Vax and Keyleth. Vax is guy is guy number three. So space three on the couch from the left is the guy who plays Vax. Space two on the couch is the girl who plays Keyleth. What's her name? I don't remember her name. Her real name. I remember her character names. Marisha. Marisha is in space two. Liam position three. Liam felt like something was going to happen between his character and Marisha's character. So he asked Matt, her husband, if that was all right. <laughs> he spoke to Matt about if that would be appropriate at the table. I don't remember what it was. I promise I don't remember what it was, but something happened in one game. I just remember thinking about it after the show and then talking to Matt in the next day or two, going like, what? Can you do this in Dungeons and Dragons? Like, would this be okay? Would you be okay with it? I, yeah. I'm not gonna go anywhere with it, but would that be okay? Would you be okay if I pretended to fuck your wife? <laughs> oh. hey. A graph paper or D and D relationship should never be a complete surprise to a player, and every person at the table should be clear about their boundaries regarding relationships. For example, once relationships did start happening in Critical Role, you can see there's a moment when a veil is drawn. I tackle her into a bit of a hug into the bed. Oh! oh. oh. Whoa. <laughs> We're already on the bed. Oh! oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and that's it for now. That's fade out. Yeah. <laughs> so, that feels to me like anti cringe, but also. They wouldn't want that in their show. The, the problem, again, with using Critical Role as your example is there are going to be choices that are made on the basis of it being a show. So, can you imagine, yeah, Hex, if they did a full, full detailed play by play? Hey, and just like Marisha kissed what's her name, maybe they just start fucking right there on the table in real life, too. It's role play, baby. Hand to the oh, fireplace. <laughs> we have. Well, Liam, I'm sorry, uh, you have a chode, so technically it deals bludgeoning damage, and Marisha's raging, so she's resistant to it. Uh, you cannot penetrate. One hour. Fate feathers. <gasps> Fate feathers! <laughs> That's a steam best date ever. Yeah, yeah, steam, steam. Steam fills steam. the camera. <laughs> One safety. Like, what did you. Do you think it's just personal boundaries? Does she think it's just personal. Does she think this represents personal boundaries and is a good example? I don't know whether they do this private. Do it like this privately or not, but I can. I can say damn sure they're not going to do like a full on degen sex role play on Twitch tool critical role uses a lot is an open table policy which means i think you literally can't i think that would probably break tos if you i'm not sure means that players are welcome to not only stand and move whenever they need to but are welcome to leave the table altogether Think about allowing this on an incredibly popular streamed show. These players go completely out of shot. Yeah, it's a pretty dramatic thing to happen on a streamed entertainment product. You're right. No frenzy rage. Part of this policy is also how players return to the table. You can always see someone reconnecting with that cast member when they come back. I'll reappear 10 feet closer to uh, Jester. Yeah. As it lurches forward and manages to just arc out of the way of your bolt. No impact. Oh well, let's see. Also, the open table can be seen. This looks more like they're just friends. And friendly with each other. Am I... This doesn't look like it's a... St they are enacting the safety tool. They Obviously, they're all working together and this is business. But th this this thing, I think, is them just being buddies who work together, having a having a friendly. I don't think this is. A th in, in the fact that Critical Role has a break baked in, a moment for the cast to take a physical and mental break from the game. A and pee. And pee. And pee. 
it's it's very rare you'll see them take a break. Uh, I think I think the only time I can remember when there were obvious bathroom breaks that were not in the break was when Laura was pregnant, which is an obvious obvious exception. I'm pretty sure it's so they can pee, you know, take cough syrup or whatever they use for their throat, drink some golem juice. I don't know. Guys, I take three breaks every stream because it's it's really emotionally taxing to do this. No, it's because I need to fucking pee, get a glass of water, shake out a bit. Don't forget, they're sitting down. They're sitting down that whole time. Gives them a chance to stand up, shake out, while still presenting, you know, uh, the, the correct uh, image to the audience. For extended periods of time. A break is necessary to let you stretch out and stuff. Get a drink, go pee, whatever you need. A quick snack that you don't want to have on stream. Maybe it's too crunchy. Fuck you guys, I'll eat my crunchy shit like I did with my fish. But some people don't do that. Sometimes this break is just in the middle of the game. But sometimes it's used to help the cast process a particularly emotional chunk of roleplay. Or when they need a break for any other reason. <laughs> Actually, yeah, as you guys are heading, <laughs> as you head your way through the atmosphere, three, two, two regular apples and one light blue one. <laughs> We're gonna go to break. <laughs> We're gonna take a break. You also have to consider. Here's another thing where it's not considering that it's a show. They like to keep things slick and smooth and moving because it's a show. You know what? Another good reason for taking a sudden break is having your break at a weird time. Matt has to run this shit. What if he runs into something and he's like, he gets DM's block and he's like, fuck, fuck, fuck. I need a sec. That's a good reason to take a break, right? Because they don't want to be sitting there going, um, 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 maybe a full break for a minute or two. However long their breaks are, I don't remember. Normally I'll watch the VOD and skip the break. Gives you a minute to like, take the pressure off and think more easily. We'll be back here in a few minutes, guys. Dude, just there was, pop there was back shit cracking. There was shit. There was something yeah. popped. You gotta put there that thing in. And you turn and lean away from it. Yeah. I was trying to put the table. You gotta leave a weapon that shit. <laughs> I'm gonna take some Advil. Yeah, <laughs> you go do that. Yeah, okay. good break. Good I'm break. gonna go take care of my wife here in a minute. Yeah. If you are in a real life role playing game, you're around the table with people, and you feel like you can't get up to get a sip and take a painkiller or something, or you can't get up to go to the toilet? That's a horrible situation. Literally just leave. And don't come back. The reason it feels like there's so much emphasis on it being leaving, like a, a, a major moment or whatever, not necessarily major, but significant moment, is because they're performing a show. If you're in someone's house or in a venue, and you feel like it's like you have to consider leaving or not to go to the bathroom and you're like is this gonna be okay that's horrific that's horrendous that doesn't require safety rules that requires getting the hell out you know i'm in love with you right oh. i'm gonna kiss her oh <coughs> <coughs> persistent call <coughs> <coughs> and on that note we're gonna go ahead and take a quick little break <laughs> which leads us the maker of this video doesn't think that that could also just simply be for drama, to let the chat, the viewers, stew in the drama. I think this is the worst possible, regardless of my thoughts on safety tools, this is the worst demonstration of them. Of all time. Of all time. Let's to our next tool, checking in or reality checks. We are real people. Reality checks. The game is fun, but in reality we may be tired or upset, or a real world thing may happen. Reality checks put the game to one side for a moment to deal with the real people at the table. When we did LARPing stuff uh, back at Wayfinder, we would have a, uh, uh, we had a thing called reality check, which was also used for like if somebody fell and broke mm -hmm. their leg or something, because sure. we were sort of outdoor physical mm -hmm. LARPers. And, but also was used for, for like discomfort emotionally. If you're sure. like, this scene's too intense for me, for whatever reason, there would be like a reality check. We all break character. We attend to this need. When it's handled, we do fantasy check and we're back in the game. So LARPing is a big no for me because of who I imagine is there. I feel like this gives weirdo attention seekers a really strong tool, a really strong disruptive tool. 
right? Oh, guys, I need a reality check. This is just too intense for me. Oh, you get everyone's attention for a minute. Enjoy, enjoy. Here are some examples of Matt dropping out of the game and making sure his players are okay. <laughs> and then you go. Okay. It really is making me feel like I've got to poop. Seventeen minutes. I'm sorry. Could you turn it off? Is the sound like? Is it like your colon is pulsing? Yeah. Do you want me to turn it off? It's making you uncomfortable. This is just normal. If someone's in a space you have control over, and they're like, "Oh, this vibrating noise is making me feel like I'm going to shit myself." And you're like, oh, sorry, do you want me to turn it off? What is this? If you need a guide for this... I literally have autism! If you need a guide for this, you're some sort of bizarro Neanderthal throwback. Like, what if someone's like, oh, my throat's really dry. Like, oh, yeah, do you want me to grab you a glass of water or something? Wow. You guys are really good with your safety tools. Shut the fuck up. Have to leave. Okay. No, leave. Yeah, no, right. it's supposed to make um, us uncomfortable. And oh my god! <laughs> All right, so you got you okay? You okay? I just saw everything reset. It was like it's like being it was being like slapped in the face. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite example of Matt checking in on a player happens when Yasha is mind controlled. Taking away a player's autonomy with a control mechanic is a potentially very triggering thing to do. Taking away a player's autonomy. I would not phrase it like that. It's not autonomy. It's control over their character. It's not autonomy. What would the word be? What would the prefix be for your character? It is absolutely a condition you should cover during the session zero and one that needs to be taken seriously. Yeah, it's, it's, it's weird being an NPC. That's <laughs> nice clip. That's a fucking amazing clip that I would use to roast someone with. Not for this. That's intense. <laughs> and that's the end of this chapter for Yasha. I feel that Yasha is obviously in the best hands with Matt. Watch Matt notice that Ashley looks just slightly upset after Yasha was mind controlled and very quickly check in with her here. Four, five, I'm oh. casting bless on everybody. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. We don't even know for sure that's what's occurring. Could be. There, there are multiple layers to why this is weird. That could be a, I'm doing the thing we discussed, Wink. The thing I said might happen is happening now, Wink. Sometimes, sometimes a cool thing you can do is as a player set stuff up with the DM that's going to be cool for the other players. Right? The other thing is... This is a special circumstance. This is people performing a show. The show is their brand. Their characters are also part of their brand. And your character, the character you play is obviously most connected to you in terms of being recognized as uh, your work or, you know, you're the person who plays this one. It's connected to you. If you're worried about the perception of you and your part in this, in this show, you might be a bit worried when your piece of it is out of your control. I feel like that's a concern that might exist in a broadcast show, especially of this size, that doesn't exist at a table, and maybe she's feeling a bit of that, which someone who's not performing a show and whose character isn't in and of itself sort of a, a brand icon uh, would have. You wouldn't have that around a table with just your friend. Okay. Worth bearing in mind. Another example of this is when Laura and Sam were excited when Laura was pregnant and her baby started to kick during the game. They fell right out of character and were just excited and in the moment together. Similar to Travis having a fidget item and the cast getting whatever food and drinks they need. What's the... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just thinking, what's the alternative? Are there people who play D&D &D and they're pregnant and they become their character and suddenly they're like, Ah, oh, there's a mind flayer and there's like a fucking... I'm becoming a mind flayer. I can feel the tentacle. I have to stab it out. Ah! Is this safety tool remembering you're actually pregnant and not killing the beast inside of you? What the fuck is this about? Are you crazy? 
What do you mean? Wow. Despite role playing, she still could tell she was Laura Bailey and pregnant, and that was a baby inside her. Whoa! What's going on? Why does everyone suddenly have autism? I don't get it. I don't get why this is worth mentioning. It's just a recognition that we're playing in the real world and there's real things happening. Safety tool, remember reality exists. This is, this is pretend. This video is pretend, or like I've said multiple times, there is an extreme mental disease that needs to be catalogued and dealt with. And those things are honestly more important than the game. Yes. A final example of a check-in is Matt encouraging his players and being on their side when they're honestly getting very frustrated and disappointed about their roles. He's acknowledging the reality that there are a group of friends around a table playing yeah. a game instead of upholding the DM versus player dichotomy. Uh, I don't think that's a dichotomy. But also, there are so many layers to this. It's, it's crazy to think it's a challenge to do that. But also, DM versus player. You can. You can have a game like that. That's fine. If it's, if it's like a pure pure like fucking number crunch meat grinder dungeon crawl where the dm's like okay i've i've got this balanced it's all balanced i've balanced it as much as i can or i'm using like a pre-written thing that's supposed to be balanced i'm gonna try and fucking kill you guys with what exists in this dungeon you can do that and that can be cool and fun but uh, I feel like the typical relationship is the DM's trying to make a fun experience for the players, as if he is the computer running a video game. And while he'll be fighting against you by controlling monsters. No, Hobo Beard, in the sense that the DM is trying to make your characters die, and his goal is to make you lose. Right? That With that mindset and that perspective, versus just making it a good game that the players might lose or might not. Might lose or might die. I might have the characters dying or might not. I think I think that's fair to say that's that's like I think it will be I don't think people will be like, that's crazy to call that DM versus player. But the more the more wild thing is you're way dude, you're way too way too into it if a player's like, oh man, my role sucked. Well, how else, how else do you respond to it? You'd be like, oh, better luck, better luck next time. You could, you could be like that. But also, like, if someone's pissed, I don't think this is a safety tool. It's just natural to be like, oh, but it, like, sorry, man. It happens. Why do I suck open, so hard, you open. guys? You know, oh, why? You why do I done you, you're actually, your character's pretty great and you play it pretty well. I don't know. For, for a dice mobile, your dice need to be cleansed. <laughs> I okay, never mind. I would kill myself if someone condescended to me that hard. <laughs> I take it back. I should have watched the clip. I I I'm good. Yeah. That first roll was so close. That first roll was so close. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's more like what I'd imagine than what, what, like, what like the natural response for me would be. In your miserable life. Um oh, oh man, eight. <laughs> oh, buddy. It was higher, so just roll Constitution two. Seven. Seven. It's gone, unfortunately. Uh, you took, did you take the work? I did. So you, it's with advantage. I was. Oh, buddy, buddy. I was so sorry. I rolled a seven and a five. Uh, a five with gone. your Constitution saving throw? Oh, and with plus con? Uh, ten. Three. Zero. Oh, ten, sixteen. Six. Never mind. Six. Okay. Our next tool for during the game is something I see Matt use a lot, which is leaning into the epicness of the story. And when the moment does happen, this is the, what, stay in the epic. Stay in the epic safety rule. Don't gloss over it. Explain the death as cinematically as you can, letting the epic final moments ring out in the party as a powerful, if incredibly sad, moment. This is very specific to high roleplay tables. If a moment is hard or scary or upsetting with big emotions, one way he helps the players in that is staying in the epicness of the story with them. Like with- Wait, if someone's shaken, if someone is disturbed, 
and shaken by a moment and they're like upset by it and it's too much make sure they're stuck in that moment for as long as possible percy here the bullet sinks into percy um you hear the air escape from his lungs as orthax suddenly flares up with darkness you watch as the edge of the barrel some sort of script that was carved in the side of one of the barrels flares away with a purple flash oh uh, i'm not unconscious that was He's that's dead. technically speaking that's three that's Percy three is now devoid of life or with molly molly mm -hmm. okay you have a brief moment as as the conscious this is this is something you that was an example of keeping your players safe that just sounds like adding a bit of fluff a bit of sauce to what's happening and I don't know, what are you talking about? What is this lady talking about? Business and life leaves you. What are your last words? <laughs> With blood. Oh, God. As it kind of slams into his face. This is encouraging drama. This is encouraging drama, which can be fun around a table with people, and is also really good for their show, because it helps make sure people are doing things that are fun for an audience to watch. Which, around a table, you do have a small audience. It is very different, obviously, but the audience is the other, the other people there. And you can do something fun or cool for them, or something that they can step in on to. And... Respect. And then twists the blade. The life leaves Molly. Eyes never shut. Or when it looked very much like Jester would not make it out of this situation alive here. Strikes both towards you. You like it, like you, there's that moment of of quiet where your eyes close and you're waiting for the imminent moment, and you hear this voice creep in your head and go, "Don't worry, I'm watching." And your arm, without even noticing, you feel like a hand push your wrist, and the shield goes up and deflects the impact. The the teeth streak across it and cling to it and begin to try and pull the shield away, and you just instinctually muscle it away. As you do, you watch two teeth shatter and fall to the ground in front. Mm. Just a, that, that moment of strength billowing up from inside a pretty strong cleric. In each one, he lent into telling an incredibly epic story for his players' characters, incredibly respecting epic them story. and the moment by staying in it. If the moment is hard with big emotions, but all the players are in it and want to stay in it, the best thing that you can do is lean into the epicness of the story. What do you mean? This is insane. This is like an alien's talking. This is just like, do you want, do you want to have hype moments? Do it. How, like someone else in chat was saying, I don't understand how this relates to, to their conception of safety. The cooler the story, the more worth the big emotions feel. Yeah, but what if, what if, the, what if you make the emotion huge and then they're like, I didn't like that, you've damaged me, and then you get fired. <laughs> from your D and D stream, I don't know, man. I don't, I don't. This doesn't fit into the hyper, hyper safe space mode. Rest of the video, I don't. I don't understand. The cooler the story, the more worth the big emotions feel. One complex example of really leaning into the story is Matt and Liam telling the story of Vax and the Raven Maybe. Queen. This story was almost a line for Liam because it was touching on things that were happening in his real life. And in like the last uh, weeks that my mom was still with us and knowing that you know, it wasn't going to be much longer, the story took a turn it took. Matt and Liam were partners in leaning into the role play and epic story. This helped Liam, and together they wove an interesting and complex story for Vax and the rest of the party. Fate touched. Always going to be a thing, or do you think that just sprang out of that moment? This is you, my champion. You are fate touched. To be perfectly honest, I decided on the fate touched thing because I know you were going through some hard stuff, and I wanted to give some little kind of special light to you. Wow. Oh, Matt. Wow. That is a friend thing. That doesn't exist within the D&D. &D. But also, I don't think that's a safety. This, is, again, is just like a buddy being like, oh, I know you, you're into the game. I thought I, it's like, I thought I'd do something cool for you. You could have also given them, like, a cookie or something. This isn't safety. This is like, friend going through something, I give a bit of extra attention or something. I don't think... 
Again, it's one of those things where I don't think that it's D&D, it matters. Wow, uh, that's crazy. I didn't know when it was going to come up. <laughs> oh, buddy. Oh. As you walk forward, you see reaching from the light, the dark hair, the fair skin, and the wide smile of your mother, Elena. As she greets you, she says, I'm so proud. Okay, that's weird as fuck. Wait. I don't remember this. He was going through his mom dying and then... Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's the chronology? Is this Liam was going through his mom dying and then Matt was role-playing as his character's dead mom? This is like, yo, we got to get those tears on the live stream. We, we got to get these tears on the live stream. Your dead mom's talking to you, Liam. Your dead mom's talking to you. She says she's proud. If I was to suggest one more safety... T I don't know. In terms of... So, okay. Either they talked about it beforehand and did that. If they didn't talk about that beforehand, if you have someone at your fucking table who's, who's going through the death of their mother and the DM starts being like, oh, your character's mom who's dead is talking to you and saying how proud and blah, blah, blah. Surely that fails the test on these safety measures. Surely whopping that out on someone fails the test. I find that fucking distasteful. Okay? It's either that, or it's planned. And then it's not really what you're showing or saying to us. If a critical role to use during the game, it would be the traffic light system. This is a system... There's a difference between unknowingly touching on something that someone's sensitive about and, like, Directly going for the throat of what you know they're struggling with, right? Where you use red and orange and green to show how you're going as a player. Liam goes so deep into character, it is sometimes very hard to tell if he is upset or if it is just his character. And he is actually just fine. Here is an example of how the traffic light system would help in these situations. <gasps> no. You're, let's say your character's angry or upset about oh. something or your character's going through something that would be kind of traumatic and you're role playing. You just hold up. Okay, this is breaking my mind. This is breaking my mind. Okay, so a line is something where you don't cross the line, you don't have it in at all. A veil is something where it can be alluded to, but you don't include it. How do you allude to gaslighting without including it in roleplay? Do you just literally say, and then he gaslighted her? Into believing what? Or just generically making her doubt herself? But then if you say she's doubting herself, doubting her sanity, then you haven't just veiled the gaslighting. Is it the act of gaslighting itself occurring that would be veiled? I don't know, dude. Up green to let everyone know you yourself are okay. You're just role playing and you are having a grand old time, even though your character seems up. It's the most it's the most dangerous spell in early D D. It's called Cloud Gaslight. If you're caught in the circumference, roll the save or instantly go insane. Set or or what have you. After the game. When you are as heavy into roleplay as the cast is, character bleed can be a real problem. A real problem. Dude, can you imagine you, you... You... Oh my god. You leave... You leave the local game store and you just knife a little person of colour because you were just fighting Durgar in the Underdark and you couldn't, you couldn't get out of your character's mindset. That's a real problem. Emotions, stress, and character conflict can bleed over into your emotions and your life. You need tools to help process and step out of character. Has it been difficult to transition from Vax and Keyleth's relationship to developing a new one for Caleb and Bo? Yes, it has. <gasps> oh, that's a fun question. Yes, it has. Been. Oh, I hate you so much. Oh. Has it been difficult? Same players, different characters. I could imagine that being tricky, especially because. Something that happens between them a lot is they'll refer to each other, not a lot, but has happened a few times, is they'll refer to each other with old characters' names. This feels like an actual skill issue question. I wonder if they'll say it's an emotional challenge. Uh, That's so fun! We have had some disputes. Onset, offset. Oh wait, what? Okay. Yep. 
I wouldn't say disputes. What what word would you use to categorize our discussions about what went down in the house? Clarifications. Clarifications. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got it, got it. <laughs> I don't remember what happens. I don't remember what this is. However, it this is definitely another situation where, where it's it's a show. It's a show, so it super matters what's going on because they care about how the public's perceiving what's going on. It's a product. It's a product. <laughs> so Bo ended up teaching me a whole new set of lessons of, I'm not defined by this character that I am playing. I can separate it. Debrief. Talking about the game or debriefing. That is a clip chimp moment. You can't just clip someone saying that. You can't just use that clip. Unless you're trying to make someone sound insane. So Bo ended up teaching me a whole new set of lessons of I'm not defined by this character that I am playing. I can separate it. Debrief. So until season two of Critical Role, you couldn't separate yourself as a human being and person from your character? No, come on. No, no, no. Talking about the game or debriefing helps you step out of character. It helps integrate new information into your brain by putting words around your feelings and helps you understand that in the meta, you're not alone. <laughs> as you walk into the Death's Respite Tavern, we're going to end tonight's session. Watch out. Mark Zuckerberg's going to sue her. No. Copyright. In the meta, you're not alone. Copyright. Copyright. <laughs> Zuckerberg, I'll sell you this, uh, this tagline. There, I'll pick this up next week. <laughs> what if they thought that shit up to make it more serious for the viewers? True. I'm sure there's an element of that. I mean, how many artsy people do stuff like that? I was just absorbed. My entire being was creating this song. But they go really far and make it literal, like the only thing in my brain. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I couldn't drink. It creates lore that makes your product more special than other things. And that's where we're going to end oh! the session for tonight. Oh! 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 You sadistic motherfucker, you cut it right there! Oh! 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 I was okay to right there! Oh! That's, nice. that's a wait that's a yeah they're cliffhangers and that's a hammed up reaction probably to get it mirrored in the audience yeah it's performance it's a performance and not even subtly like he's not even trying to hide that it's it's not like he's faking that reaction it's a hammed up it's a hyper hammed up reaction it's not even meant to be taken at face value what the fuck and we're gonna take a break right here uh that Reaction was a bit draining for me, so I need time to excrete my upset through my penis into the toilet bowl. We're not, we're not quite done yet. We're learning how to stay safe while playing make-believe. After the game is finished and everyone goes home, the debrief will continue. After the game is finished and everyone goes home, the debrief will continue? I don't want this... Fuck playing D&D &D unless I'm getting paid for it. You have to do that. What do you mean? This is a job. Matt talks here about the cast group chat and how he checks in with the players after the game. It's Thursday night. The game is gone. Great. <laughs> You're in the car on the way. <laughs> is Matt Mercer coming to my house to give me a ticket? Again, I feel like it's a bit different when you're running a massive show. You probably do want to talk about it quite a lot afterwards. Home, what goes through your mind? And you might, you might in your home game, just because you're like, yo, that was cool. Remember when this happened? This happened. Oh yeah, dude. On the good nights, on the nights where you feel like, yeah, that was it. And the first thing I do is turn to Mercia and say, Jeff, fun. Mm. Like every time, that's my first priority. I want to make sure the players had a good time, and we'll text afterward and make sure everyone had a good time. On the nights where maybe things don't go the way you wanted them to, or you feel like one of the players is didn't enjoy it or had a bad experience what's going how 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 different are those nights for you what's going through your mind those moments happen and they have happened <laughs> the debriefing will continue until you consent no there are four dwarves um it's it's about talking about it i'll ask and be like hey hey what's what's on your mind you know what has you worried about this or what what bothered you about this scenario you're my friend first 
exactly. ultimately, yeah. Before a player, you're my friend. I care about your experience. Exactly. And so I would I would ask them directly. You know what what bothers you about this circumstance, this interaction? More and more, this feels like a person and group of people who are aware of what kind of person makes up a large proportion of their audience. Perhaps trying to give them the advice on how to be a human being that they. In Critical Role, they also do a very specific debrief when a player character dies. Go out with the players to get drinks or a fine meal to celebrate the memory of the character as just a group of friends sitting in a restaurant somewhere. What the fuck? That just seems like a good time that you springboard off of the game you're playing. That's what that, What the fuck? This sounds like we played D&D &D together. Oh, a really significant thing happened. You know what? You want to go get dinner? That was sick. Shall we... Shall we... Yay! Oh, damn, you died! Oh, bro, don't worry, we're gonna go get burgers. Yeah! This doesn't feel like some sort of... I don't know! It doesn't feel like a moral or safety thing. It's just, like a ch it's just, a, it's just a fucking chill thing to do. That could be fun. Like, I don't disagree. Hey, something huge happens. Someone lost their character or whatever. A major thing happens in the game. Could be negative like that, could be positive. That's not... Your character dying isn't necessarily negative. It could be, maybe they went out like a hero and you're like, damn, dude, it sucks you lost your character, but man, that was, that was awesome. Great. You guys want to go get dinner and talk about th that, talk about that session? That sounds like a good idea and a good time. Not medical <laughs> practice. <laughs> I don't know. It uh, really also helps get rid of all the tension of the moment and let you guys remind yourself that it's just a game and you're all friends still having a good time even when the sad moments happen. Your friends who are in this game that you trust enough, you should all also support each other when those dark moments happen outside of the game. Whenever we lose a character in the game, we have like a wake. We go to an Irish pub that we go Aww. to often in Burbank and we all get drinks and we have a wake for that character. What? I don't think that that is how the person making this video imagines it is. But again, also be aware that this, they, they know that this is being broadcast. And isn't that an interesting story? Isn't that interesting lore behind the game? Experience, because it is, even though it is make-believe and it is a game, that is still a loss. And that's not a bad thing either. Loss is an important thing to process, because life... Now he's being so deep. Okay, never Comes mind. with loss. And part of the wonderful experiences of role-playing games is it allows us a safe space to explore very positive and very negative emotions in a healthy way and make us better people through it. So just be there for them, be supportive, and be the best friends and co-players you can be. A healthy way. I'm scared that the message people get is, you know, you know what a healthy way to explore your emotions is? Just fucking dissociate and believe you're someone you're not. And act through things. That uh, that you deal with those emotions in a different skin. I don't know. Is that is that healthy? You need to remember that the DM is a player too. Game safety is everyone's responsibility, and these tools apply to the DM just as much as it applies to the player. However, ultimately, the DM shoulders a lot of the emotional burden of the game. One thing you can do for your DM is give them a star and a wish. Everyone goes. <laughs> <laughs> I think this is the last, I think this is the last tool. One thing you can do for your DM is give them a star and a wish. Please. Please, how does the video keep getting <laughs> more painful? I swear to God, if this is literally giving them a gold star, I'm gonna lose my shit. Around the table or in a text chat and just says one thing they really loved about the game that's a star and one thing that they would love to see in the game in the future that's a wish it's so fake this feels like a guide on how to manipulate your dm into working harder <clears throat> tell them what was great and then give them a job to do what the fuck this really helps with what's known as dm if you present, okay, if you present it like, oh, that was so great. Oh, and you know what I'd like to see in the future? Blah, 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 blah. If it was presented it to me like, if, if it was presented to me like that, I would assume the first part is to soften the blow of them telling me what they actually want. That, 
I think is how it would come across to me. Drop, which is a feeling that happens at the end of the game when the DM feels like they've done a terrible job, even though the players have had a great time. This really It would make me feel like I've done a bad job, to be honest. This, this. Oh, that's really good. Especially now that it's formalized. The thing is, you can't tell people to do this. You can't, you can't put out a video that's like, give them a star and a wish. Because guess fucking what? If people do that, the DM then knows they're doing the fucking star and a wish thing. They're doing the fucking star and a wish thing. They want something. Specific feedback can help the DM see that the players are invested and as a DM, they've done a great job. Aftercare. Aftercare are ways... That... Wait, I thought that section was the aftercare. I thought this whole thing was the aftercare. We're on to the aftercare now. Dude, if, you, if, this, if this image reflects what's going on after a game of D&D, &D, something is horribly wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. About maybe on Friday, something that happened on Thursday night, and you're like, man, like I need to get out of this funk. Like, do you have ways of coping? Yeah, I pull my head out of the game. I'll, I'll, I will play a game with my kid or I'll watch a movie with my wife or go running or running is great. D&D &D fans, Critical Role fans discover the existence of going outside. I don't know what else to take this as. Did you know there is more to life than rolling dice? I sleep in a big bed with my wife. <laughs> what do you do when you're done playing D&D? &D? I sleep in a big bed with my wife. What do you do, sweaty nerd? Let's look at a scene and see how many of these safety tools we can observe from just one moment of critical oh! I'll pop this animation over any safety tools that I can see and let me know if you see any others in the comments. Ah! It's an episode of fucking Dora the Explorer. Mama. Mama. Link leans up to the cage and puts his hand over the outside of the bar and Link reaches out for you with the other hand. Checking in? Her reaching over and touching his arm? That doesn't feel like a safety tool. They're just like, oh, this moment, this moment. To your, to your buddy you're playing a game with. Ooh, it's hype. That's not a safety tool. Well, yeah, also, yeah, it's a show. There is, there is a performance element to it. But if we pretend that they're not doing a performance, what they're put she's not performing a safety tool. Finds his fingers. Mama, mama. You came. <laughs> what a fucking good shot of Sam. Demented goat Christ. New safety tool. New safety tool uh looking at someone. Is this they fucking sent the Terminator back, but he was broken? And this is what he sees through his eyes. He just watches Critical Role and scans them for like schizo imagined safety measures. Feedback stars. Oh. All of you guys being so. like embodying your character so well. It just is so easy. It's the best game. Mm -hmm. It's the best yeah. game. And I had so much fun. <laughs> You're so great. Oh, telling the people who show you would probably want to appear on again because it's massive exposure that it's a good time. Feedback, kissing ass. Feedback, kissing ass. So as you can see, safety tools can be subtle and can look really organic, but it's important to explicitly set them up at your table. Finally, how do you just, say- Just make sure every interaction you have is as robotic as fucking possible. Stay happy and safe watching Critical Role as an audience member. As the audience, what how are you looking after yourself while watching Critical Role? What the fuck is this? This is a step further. How do you stay safe watching people play D&D? Do you watch Talks Machina and talk with different people to debrief? No, because I'm not a crazy person. Do you have a good crit role buddy like I have with Sarah? that you watch the show with or live tweet with. Seems about right. We now also have the Crit Roll Content Warning Project on- 